In Cinema 4D R17, the motion tracker has been updated to work with lens correction for 2D tracking and a motion tracker graph view to help you troubleshoot those difficult tracks. When tracking footage that has lens distortion present, you may notice that those flat planes are never really flat. But by compensating for the lens distortion present in the footage, you can get significantly better results. So let's take a look at how it works. To take advantage of the lens distortion workflow with the motion tracker, you'll have to set up the motion tracker manually. To do this, we'll go to the motion tracker menu and then select motion tracker. This will add the motion tracker object into our object manager. Next, we want to load in our footage, so we're going to go to the footage tab and then click on the open file button beside the footage link. We then want to select the first frame of our footage. That will load it into the view. Next, we don't want to be working on downsampled footage, so we're going to set the resampling to 100%. This ensures that we're working with the full 1080p frame. Now, if you take a look at the footage in the view, you'll see that the trees have a fairly prominent curvature, as well as the sidewalk and the sides of the buildings here. This is going to cause issues with our reconstruction. This is where the lens profile comes in. You're going to start by clicking on the Open File button beside the Lens Profile link, and then navigate to wherever you saved the lens profile from the Lens Distortion tool. If you want to find out more about creating your own lens profile, check the link in the description. Now, we'll select the GoPro 4 Hero lens, and we can see, in the viewport, the lens correction being applied. If we hold Alt or Option on the keyboard and then right click and drag in the viewport, you'll see that you can zoom in or out of your footage. Zooming out shows us the full lens correction being applied to the footage here. Now that the lens correction has been applied, we can get into tracking. We'll start by clicking on the 2D tracking tab. This will allow us to set up the attributes for the 2D track. Because we're using such high resolution footage, we want to increase the number of tracks to make sure that we're getting a fairly good number of tracks to use for the final reconstruction. In this case, we'll set it to 1500. Next, we want to set the minimum spacing between tracks. Again, with high resolution footage, we want to increase the minimum spacing to make sure that we're getting a fairly even distribution of features throughout the footage. In this case, We'll set it to 35. Next, we want to go to the Options tab. Here, we're going to set the default pattern size and the default search size for features in the footage. Again, with higher resolution footage, we want to increase the pattern size. This is because the features we want to track might be larger due to the increased number of pixels. So we'll set this to 45, and we'll also increase the default search size. A value of 100 should work fine here. Next, we can go back to the automatic tracking, and we're almost ready to go. The last step is to set the frame indicator to frame 80, or about halfway through your footage. This way, when you click on auto track, it will set a keyframe at this point in time, and then track forward from this frame, and when that's finished, it will track backward from this frame. This should provide you with a fairly even distribution of good tracks over time. With the 2D track complete, we can then go to the first frame and hit play just to review our track. If we want to get a closer look, we can hold down the Alt key and then right click and drag to zoom in, and we can also middle click and drag to pan the view. This will give us an easy way to check out our tracks. Now let's just pause that and go back to the first frame. Next, we'll go back to the footage tab and click full footage so that we can see our full frame. Now, we want to make sure that we're using only the best tracks for our final reconstruction. So we can go to the 2D tracking and enable the error threshold or the maximum acceleration or adjust any of these attributes to filter out the tracks that do not match these values. But sometimes we want to see more. In this case, we can go to the motion tracker menu and select the motion tracker graph view. This will open the Motion Tracker Graph View. By default, the Motion Tracker Graph View is going to display a top-down view of the tracks in our scene. The color coding is related to the type of information that is being displayed. In this case, we're looking at the 2D tracking errors. If we click one of the toggles up at the top here, we can change between the different types of data. Now, if we go back to the 2D tracking error, the red values are representing a high error value, 
Well, green values are showing something that is a low error value, or a good track. So we can see a bunch of these tracks here have high error values. We can click and drag in the motion tracker graph view to select multiple tracks, and then press S to frame the selected tracks, or O to go to the first frame of those. We can also hit H on the keyboard to frame all again. Now, we have several different options to try and clean up these tracks. Some of them are only bad for a small section. In this case, we can move the frame indicator around to a point where they start to go bad, and then right-click and choose Trim Track. This will trim off the bad portion of that track. Now, we can see that we have two fairly bad tracks here. If we hold down Alt on the keyboard, or Option, and then middle click and drag, we can pan the view around. This lets us see that these tracks are pretty much bad the whole time. So we can just hit Delete to remove them from the entire scene. The top-down view isn't the only way that we can interact with this data. We can go to a graph view, and this is going to display all of the tracks over top of each other. Again, we can use the same shortcut commands to pan or zoom in on the data. If we select any of these lines, it will also select the corresponding track in the viewport. This also applies to the top-down view. Now, we can see that a lot of these tracks have high error values towards the ends. With them selected, we can just hit delete to remove them from the track. One thing that we can also do here is if we enable the error threshold in the filter tracks, we'll now see a red line in the motion tracker graph view. We can click and drag this line to adjust the error threshold value. This gives us a quick way to remove our tracks while having a good visual indication of what we are actually removing. We can also go back down to the top-down view and hit H and see that we have significantly less tracks in the entire scene but we can be pretty sure that all these tracks are good enough for doing the reconstruction. So, we can close the motion tracker graph view, and then go to the reconstruction tab, and run the 3D solver. With the solve complete, we'll go ahead and calibrate the scene. So we'll jump into the solved camera, and then right click on the motion tracker, and choose a planar constraint. We'll then set this to a few of our tracks, and then set our axis to the Y+. Plus. Next, we're going to right-click again, go to the Motion Tracker tags, and add a Position Constraint. We want to set this to one of our tracks on the ground. With the Point Constraint set, we want to deselect the Point Constraint, and then we can take a look at one of our orthographic views. In the front view, we can see that all of the points that should be laying along the ground plane are. So, Let's go ahead and set up some scene geometry so we can render this out. We'll start by going to the Motion Tracker, then to the Footage tab, and create a background object. Next, we'll create a floor object, and this is going to line up with the ground plane that we set, and we'll copy the tag from the background to the floor. Then we can right-click on the floor, and choose our compositing tag, and set it to Compositing Background. Now, we want to add some geometry to the scene, so we'll go ahead and add a cylinder. We can adjust its size, and then change its position, as well as its height. We'll create a couple duplicates of the cylinder, just so that we can see the effect of the lens distortion at different positions and distances. Next, we'll go ahead and render to the picture viewer. With the render complete, we can see that the material applied to the background object and to the floor is using the original footage. So we have distortion that bends the trees, as well as the buildings, and the line along the sidewalks. But if we look at the objects in our scene, they do not have any lens distortion at all. This breaks the effect of them fitting into this scene. So, we need to go to the Render Settings, and then to the Effect button, and here we can add in a lens distortion post effect. We need to select the lens profile that we used earlier, so we'll click on the Open File button, and then locate the lens profile that we used. This will load in the lens profile. If we render to the picture viewer again, you can see that the objects now have the correct distortion applied. With the inclusion of a lens distortion workflow in R17, you can now get significantly better results, right from tracking all the way to the final render.